Yeah. Okay. I give you my email, right? With two A's, yeah. That's why I told him to turn off the thing. Yeah. It was hot. Okay, guys. <clears throat> Number one, you know, these cells, for example, parietal cells, G cells, M cells, and chief cells, mucus cells, and so forth cells, they're not only found on the greater curvature. I don't want to mislead you. So if don't always imagine that I told you there's no such thing as selective here and there. It, they're found all over the stomach. All over the stomach. Okay? So I have limits in my diagrams, you know, because some, I can't just draw all over the place. So just for simplicity, we do that. But again, they're found on greater curvature, smaller curvature, and so forth. Oh, I haven't even done that. Uh, when it comes to stomach, we should be able to recognize this one is known as the greater curvature of the stomach. Green. Red is the lesser curvature or smaller curvature. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> Know that there is a fatty layer, you know, like if you're wearing a cape or, you know, like Latinos, they wear those, what do you call those? Machos? Pachos? <laughs> <laughs> like they're macho people, that's awesome. I thought Pashtuns were... <laughs> okay, ponchos, right? You know, like you can lift it and so forth. There's a layer known as peritoneum or omentum. Omentum. There's greater and smaller omentum. I'll talk about it. But just know that too. When I come to blood vessels, Muhammad is going to remind me about blood vessels so I don't forget. Now let's go further. Now, so let's go to parietal cells. Okay, let's go to parietal cells. Here we go. This is parietal cells. On parietal cells, you have a receptor known as the M receptor. You have the H2 receptor. What M? Muscarinic 1 and 3. Never 2. 2 is only found on the heart. Okay, muscarinic receptor. M stands for muscarinic. So let's put M1 and M3. And then you have G receptor or gastrin receptor. Okay? Alright. All of us know that these cells, these parietal cells, produce HCL. HCL, okay? What if you use drugs that blocks the M receptor, muscarinic receptor? What do you think would happen? Decrease, 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 decrease. decrease acidity. So let's call them muscarinic antagonist. Muscarinic antagonist. Write it down. Muscarinic antagonist. Muscarinic antagonist. Medication that block the M receptor. You know it's going to decrease HCL. Very good. So do you think you can treat acidity, reflux, GERD, ulcers with this group of medication? Yeah. Yes, of course. So you can call them anti-muscarinic or muscarinic antagonist. Doesn't change anything. Same thing. Anti-muscarinic or muscarinic antagonist. Good? Now, what is the <clears throat> hormone that acts on the muscarinic receptor? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. So you can call them anticholinergic. You can also call them anticholinergic. Anticholinergic. Okay. <clears throat> what if you block the entire parasympathetic nervous system? Same thing. Okay. So anticholinergic. Antimuscarinic. And what else did I say? Cholinergic antagonist. Okay. Okay. Muscarinic antagonist. Same thing. Please memorize these names because all of them means the same thing. Some is named after uh, receptor, others on uh, acetylcholine, right? Anticholinergic, cholinergic antagonist, they're based on acetylcholine. Muscarinic antagonist, antimuscarinic, they're based on the receptor. At the end, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> if you say, you know what? I have a key that is a master key. Well, it still opens all locks, so it doesn't matter how you say it. At the end, the result is the same. Okay.
Now, what if you have medication that blocks the H2 receptor? So what would you call it? Antihistamine. Antihistamine. Excellent. Antihistamine. But they're specific. They're not antihistamine 1, which is for allergies. This is actually antihistamine 2 receptor. So call it antihistamine for now. That's good enough. Or you can also call them H2 blockers. H2 blockers. Yeah. H2 blockers. So call them H2 blockers. Call them antihistamine. That's fine. Now, there's no such thing yet that blocks gastrin receptor. At least I don't know of that. If there is, but in, in theory, if you have antigastrin, is there any hormone that's antigastrin? <coughs> there's one hormone that's, that's a hater. It hits gastrin? hits every other hormone. No. No, 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 no. There you go, Sam. Yeah, somatostatin. Somatostatin, somatostatin, somatostatin. Somatostatin, this hormone inhibits all hormones, so it could be used. But again, it has a lot of other negative effects, right? It's not selective, it's general, so we don't use it. But just know that if there's a hormone that activates G cells or inhibits G cells, you will know what happens. Okay, let's name now medication in reality. This was in theory. Let's talk about reality. Atropine is anticholinergic, antimascarinic. Atropine. Let me write it down. You can call it atropine. <clears throat> atropine is a drug that blocks muscarinic receptors all over the place, even in, on the heart. Okay, so we can, again, if such thing is so general, would you want to prefer to use something so general? Wouldn't you expect a drug like that that is general has more side effects? Yeah. Of course. Okay, so we're looking for something selective. Now, <clears throat> antihistamine. Do you know the name of any antihistamine? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Cymetidine is the most toxic one. Renadine is another one that's better. Yeah. So that's one. So far we have antihistamine in blue and we have atropine in red. So at least we know two drugs, but you have to memorize a general group name. H2 blockers, there's many of them. All of them would end with tidine or tidine if you want to call it that way. Okay, <clears throat> muscronic blockers, there's many of them. Yeah, okay, so we'll have to focus on them. We'll learn their names. Okay, now also, what if you can block this channel or this pump? There is this proton pump. What if you can block this pump? Yeah. This is not going to affect anything except this cell. Okay. Especially if you take it orally. Because it comes where first? In the stomach. It doesn't even have to go further. Right? <laughs> Amazing. So proton. So th this will be called proton. Proton. Now, what does proton mean to you? Any atom that only has proton but no electron. See, hydrogen has one proton, one neutron, one electron. But if you remove the electron, it becomes positive one. As soon as you see a positive hydrogen ion, it's always called the proton because it has no electron. So that's another name. It's misnomer. It's not truly proton, right? We're not talking about submolecular particle. Proton pump inhibitor. Or you call it PPI, right? Okay. And do you know the name of such medication? Okay, so there you go. Umeperazole. <clears throat> so at least now you know there's three classes of medication available to regulate acid secretion in the stomach. Okay, three groups. All three of them will decrease what? HCL production, HCL production. Mm -hmm. So now when you have HCL production decreased <clears throat> with a proton pump inhibitor, this will not affect intrinsic factor. Okay? So now when HCL production is decreased, what does that mean? What happens to protein digestion? 
it's decreased as well. So could you have diarrhea as a side effect? Yes. Protein malabsorption as a side effect? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Especially if you overdo it and you're one of those persons, you're like, I want to get better. I think, you know, you, you, you worry about quantity than quality. You're like, the more I eat, the most likely my ass will go away suddenly, forever. <laughs> there are people like that. So they will have protein malabsorption. Yeah. You can use uh, the three groups or combination of two? If you wish, but no, you don't need to. You don't need to. You don't need to. Now, amongst these three drugs, what's the best option? PPI. PPI. They're very safe. They're very safe. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. There's no such thing in this case as buildup. Okay, if a factory is supposed to produce HCL and then there's no need for HCL production or it's blocked, they won't produce more. Okay, they won't produce more. Okay? Mm -hmm. No, but I, I understand what he's saying because we just came from biochemistry. Yeah. We're build up and things were a big issue. Yeah. In this case, when you block the pump, that means there's a negative feedback that tells the prior cells you don't have to produce a lot. You don't have to produce a lot, so it doesn't affect. It's, new, it's, it's used by the cell in different ways. Okay? Okay, <clears throat> good. So please understand these three medications, their effect on parietal cells. you got to know their effect on parietal cells. Omeprazole is very, very safe. Okay, the most you'll get is GI disturbance. And you know why? Because of protein malabsorption. Okay, so if you cannot absorb protein, maybe it'll cause diarrhea and so forth. Again, that's if it does cause it. Again, it's very safe medication. Okay, but it will increase pH of the stomach. Remember that physiology questions are important in this case. It will increase, omeprazole will increase stomach pH, decrease stomach HCL, increase basicity, decrease acidity of the stomach, not a plasma. S same thing with atropine cementity. Now, further, atropine has a lot of side effects because it would act on other muscarinic receptors. It will decrease or increase your heart rate. Increase, it will cause tachycardia, increase contraction and sweating. So atropine, we have to be careful. That's why it's not used for this purpose. Atropine is reserved for cardiac problems. Cemetidine has a huge, huge problem. It, it blocks P450. It blocks P450, therefore increasing the toxicity of other drugs. Okay. Therefore, it decreased toxicity of, I mean, increased toxicity of other drugs, so you have to worry about that. So, is methane a competitive inhibitor? Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, so, I, again, I'll come with the pharmacology at the end of the section, but as long as you know some basic things right now. Okay. Basic things. So, now, when would you use this medication? What would you use it for? GERD, excellent. Anything else? Peptic ulcer disease. No, not gastritis. Not gastritis. Huh? <clears throat> We're going to gastritis soon right now. And then we'll see. Okay, so please understand this medication. And it is upon you right now to think without me giving you the answers. How you can use them, when you can use them. At the end of the day, all three medication decreases what? Stomach acidity. Is that a bad thing or a good thing? You, would, you have to make that decision. In normal people, it's a bad thing. With peptic ulcer, it's a good thing. In acid reflux, it's a good thing. So it depends. Okay? As we discuss more, I mean, more uh, uh, diseases, it will make more sense. But for now, this is the first thing you have to memorize. Okay, let's move on to in terms of blood supply of the stomach. Blood supply of the stomach. Remember when we talk about an embryology, the gut tube is made of what? Section. It has three sections. Foregut, midgut, and hindgut. What is the junction of foregut and midgut? Yes, Raima. 
Where exactly? <coughs> sphincter of Odi or something. Not something. Sphincter of Odi. Okay, so let's say there's a gallbladder here, okay? So the gallbladder. I'm just doing this for the identification, otherwise you don't have to. Gallbladder will give you cystic duct and hepatic duct. And this duct will come behind and enter right here. And then it will combine with pancreatic duct. This is the junction. This is the junction of foregut and midgut. This is the junction. The junction between foregut and midgut is what? Sphincter of Odi area or ampulla vater. Okay. Sphincter is a circular muscle over here that's supposed to, like a valve, that's supposed to close this area and open. And ampulla is this dilated area. When the two ducts join, the pancreatic duct and bile duct are one single duct. That's known as ampulla vater. So ampulla vater is actually a large duct. Sphincter is just a circular muscle. Okay. All right. <clears throat> good, good, good. Now, behind this, we should have a huge blood vessel. Aorta. Okay, so let's say this is aorta. Abdominal aorta. Okay, aorta gives you three branches. What was the major artery of foregut? Celiac trunk. Celiac trunk. So it gives you a branch on the celiac trunk. Okay. Celiac trunk will give you one branch. It will, celiac trunk has three branches. Okay. Huh? Very good. It gives you one branch. That's called left gastric. It supplies the smaller left half of the smaller curvature of the stomach. Okay. <clears throat> so left gastric. I'll put left L G A. Left gastric artery left gastric artery is supposed to supply and it does the left half of the smaller curvature and upper lower esophagus or sphincter les that's what it does and then it'll give you common hepatic okay common hepatic which is a bigger one so i'll use the big one it gives you a common hepatic okay <clears throat> and then it gives you what what else splenic. splenic artery which will go behind the stomach okay Splenic will go behind the stomach and go supply the spleen. So it gives you three branches. Okay, splenic, common hepatic, left gastric. These are three branches of what? Celiac trunk. Celiac trunk. Let me label it for you. So this would be the splenic artery. Again, it goes behind the stomach. So splenic artery. And this one is common hepatic common hepatic artery right here <clears throat> as far as I know at least we have one part of the stomach taking care of the left half of smaller curvature okay now <clears throat> the common hepatic will divide into hepatic proper and gastroduodenal okay so it will give you this branch gastroduodenal which come behind the duodenum like this gastroduodenal so yeah okay so i don't know why is it so maybe i can do this i'm becoming obsessive compulsive it's okay there you go can you see the shadow now haha <laughs> i got you there you go <clears throat> and then let's do this one too there you go. Okay, so now, gastroduodenal. You see this is gastroduodenal right here? Maybe I should start putting numbers, okay? Number one, gastroduodenal. Number one is gastroduodenal. I'll put numbers so that way you can remember them easily. Let's just forget about the aorta. It's cut so we can see things. So number two was celiac trunk, right? Number two is celiac trunk. Three, right, left, gastric. left gastric. Four, right. splenic. Five, right. common hepatic. And then six, uh, hepatic artery or hepatic proper is correct. Good job. Now, <clears throat> we'll leave that for liver later on. 
Gastroduodenum. What does it mean when you say gastroduodenum? It goes to gastro. Yeah, it gives you two branches at the end. The gastroduodenum should split because the name is telling gastro and duodenum. It should give you a branch that will become gastric artery. Okay, don't write it yet. I'm just telling you the names. Don't write it yet. So it will give you a branch that's supposed to supply the stomach. And that's supposed to supply the greater curvature. Greater curvature. The right half of the greater curvature. So it's known as gastroepiploic, right gastroepiploic artery. So number seven, right? Number seven is right gastroepiploic artery. Right gastroepiploic artery. Right gastroepiploic artery is a branch of what? Beautiful, amazing, amazing gastroduodenum. So the gastroduodenum will further give you a branch that goes across what? The duodenum. So it's supposed to supply the duodenum. So this was number one. You know behind? Number seven. And this is number eight. So number eight is duodenal artery. Seven is gastro right gastroepiploic artery. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> it would also give you a branch. Okay, it will also give you a branch known as superior. I'll leave for pancreas. Forget it, because it will confuse you. The head of the pancreas sits where, in the C-shaped area, right? Mm -hmm. So that means the head of the pancreas is also supplied by what? A branch of gastroduodenal. It's superior pancreatic artery. I'll I'll come to that. So at least we have two arteries that supply the stomach now, right? Since we're talking about stomach, number three, and number seven. Good. But the hepatic artery also give you a branch that supplies a smaller curvature of the stomach on the right side. Right gastric artery. That's number nine. Number nine is right gastric artery. Right gastric artery. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to erase the other names because we don't care for them right now. Okay. So we care for these ones. The one that supplies the stomach. So as far as I'm concerned, we have at least the smaller curvature of stomach is taken care of. Done. It's supplied by two arteries, right gastric and left gastric. But you have to know what is the origin of those two arteries. Yeah, you have to know. Not even common, it sometimes comes from, in some cases from common, in some cases from hepatic proper. Okay, so be aware of that. <clears throat> so at least the smaller curvature of stomach, is taken care of by two gastric arteries, right and left gastric arteries. <clears throat> now, the splenic artery will supply the spleen, but it will also give a branch which supplies the left side of the greater curvature, and that should be number 10, right? Number 10. Okay, obviously, these two will anastomose here, right? So I'm going to color green the one that you have to know. Number 10, number 7, number 1, 9, and 3, and 2. At least for today, you have to know these arteries. <clears throat> the major trunk of the foregut, in terms of arteries, known as celiac trunk, the basic, the single artery that branches to so many different arteries. That's why it's called celiac trunk. Trunk, trunk, it's the trunk of all major arteries. And the celiac trunk will split into three major arteries, splenic. Splenic artery is huge, which, which transverse or which crosses behind the stomach. Behind the stomach. On the superior border of <coughs> pancreas. Okay? So, I mean, in my picture, it's not good. So, be, I'll show when we talk about pancreas. So, it goes along the superior margin of pancreas. So, let me start with two. Celiac trunk is the only artery of our gut. Are we good? That's one thing you need to know. Number two, celiac trunk gives you three branches. Left gastric, splenic, and common hepatic. <clears throat> okay, so celiac trunk gives you three branches. Left gastric, common hepatic, and splenic. Done. <clears throat> okay. Left gastric supplies the left half of greater smaller curvature. Common hepatic or hepatic proper will give us one more branch known as the right gastric artery. Left and right gastric artery supplies what? The smaller curvature of the stomach. 
right by right half, left by left half. Okay, let's move on to the greater curvature of stomach. The greater curvature of stomach is applied by the left and right gastroepiploic arteries. By left and right gastroepiploic arteries. But the problem comes, you have to memorize, is that the left gastric epiploic artery comes from where? And the right gastric epiploic artery comes from where? Okay. Left gastroepiploic artery is a branch of splenic artery. Left. The right gastroepiploic artery is a branch of gastroduodenal. Gastroduodenal. Of course, all of them are branches of celiac trunk. <laughs> you know? All of them are branches of celiac trunk. Okay. So that's important. Why is that important? What if the stomach there's an ulcer that's bleeding, right? Mm -hmm. That's when it will be important. So these arteries are important when it comes to stomach. You should know them. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Location of one. Position of one is behind the duodenum. Please remember that. It's behind the duodenum related to the, <coughs> to the uh, bile duct. In my picture, they're far away. They should be close together. Okay. In my picture, they're far away. So let me show you. I can do that later too, I guess. So they're related. Okay, so they're related to the posterior side of duodenum. So duodenum is in front, the first part of duodenum. I'll come back to those, but just please remember that. In this area, if you have duodenal ulcer, it can affect all of this. And then even the gallbladder is in reality is not like the way I have it. Gallbladder is much much closer because I should have had more space gallbladder one um, what was the point of me erasing it if I have I don't think <laughs> okay so it will go behind the duodenum and then come and go like this. So the duodenum actually, in front of the duodenum you have gallbladder. You see the gallbladder literally goes like this on top of duodenum, like this. You're just sitting on it. <coughs> okay, so remember this this anatomy. Okay, remember that. Um, to even make it more accurate, that's important because of gallstones, which we're going there soon. Yeah, this is more. And then you will have the cystic duct. Okay. <clears throat> so there you go. That's the blood supply of stomach. Stomach should be supplied by four arteries. Left and right, mm -hmm. gastric arteries. Left and right, gastroepiploic. You need to know what curvature is supplied by what? Right half, left half by what? And what are the, these arteries or branches of what? That's it. Not difficult. Not difficult at all. Okay. So you know the physiology, you know the embryology, you know the gross anatomy to an extent. I have to do a little bit more about gross anatomy uh, and histology of stomach. Before we go to diseases, let's do one more thing. Now, if this is the stomach, we need to know what is exactly its location in the body. Okay. So let's do anatomy. <clears throat> This area is actually very busy, so very, very busy. Inferior to the stomach or slightly posterior to the stomach should be pancreas, okay? And I'll do pancreas in a shadow format so that you know it is behind the stomach like this. So pancreas is behind the stomach. The head of the pancreas is surrounded by, wrapped around by the duodenum. Okay. And this anatomy is important too. Remember, splenic artery goes along the tip of the pancreas, or the top border of the pancreas, and supplies spleen. So here, to the left of the stomach, you have what? Spleen. Spleen. So shouldn't splenic artery be going towards the spleen? Yes. And you can see that, look, the tip of the pancreas goes into the spleen. It goes into the spleen. 
Okay. So there's a ligament that's on the pancreatic or splenic or splenopancreatic ligament. Gastrosplenic ligament. So spleen should have three impression on it. When you look at spleen, so let's say let's look in the inside of the spleen, you know this side of the spleen, the inside. There is the pancreatic impression and there's the gastric impression and there's the renal impression. So spleen should have three impression on its medial surface. Medial surface. Let's say this is my body, this is the spleen on the left side. Three things can actually have impression. They're in contact with the spleen. Now we're talking about the stomach, so know that spleen is related laterally to the stomach. Laterally. Spleen is laterally related to what? To the stomach. Okay. At what level? We need to understand the level. Talk about ribs. 9, 10, 11. 9, 10, 11. 9, 10, 11. Okay, 9, 10, 11. So, rib 9, 10, and 11. Okay. And 11 is not because it's half a rib. It's floating rib, so not much. Okay. So, when you have rib fractures, I mean, spleen can be affected. Okay. <clears throat> Again, we're talking about stomach. So, <clears throat> now, posterior to the stomach there is an area known as its peritoneum. Okay, it's an area of the peritoneum, a gutter or a sac. Gastroepiploic sac. Gastroepiploic sac. Gastroepiploic sac. Okay. I should have used yellow for something else. Okay. Now you see from the smaller curvature, from the greater curvature of stomach, there is like that, whatever we talk about. What do we talk about? That Spanish thing? Yeah, there's a match that's hanging like this. Okay. In front. This covers everything. This is covering all the abdominal structure. So when you do surgery, you have to remove this. It's almost like in front of the most anterior structure. About It covers all the <coughs> abdominal organs. Okay. This is known as the greater omentum. Greater. Because it's attached to what? Greater curvature. It covers everything. But its origin is what? Okay. The greater curvature. Greater omentum. It gives moisture. You know, keeps the organs moist. Because it's lipid. And it keeps it soft and warm. In that sense. Okay? It also carries the arteries to the intestine. Yeah. Yeah. There are arteries within them. Yeah. Very good. Now on top you will have... <clears throat> from the small, you will have a smaller omentum. Or lesser omentum. Smaller curvature, lesser curvature, or smaller or lesser omentum, which doesn't go that far. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So again, we talked about lateral to the stomach, posterior to the stomach. Okay. Inferior to the stomach without the omentum. So again, the structure I'm going to draw, imagine this is behind the stomach. I mean, behind the omentum. That is the transverse colon. Transverse colon. Yeah. Transverse colon. Inferior and slightly anterior. Okay. So which is in front of the most in most anterior structure? Is the large intestine transverse colon. And of course behind that is inferior to the stomach is the third and fourth part of duodenum. Okay, which I can't see it in this case because I have this in front of it. So relationship are important because what? If there's a stomach ulcers and ruptures or there's gastric cancer, where would it go? And you have to be smart. What if it goes inferior? What if it goes lateral? What if it goes medial? What if it goes superior? That's your job to know where this cancer is most likely to travel or extend to. You know, for example, if you have a roof that's leaking, you know what's, what's under that, what could be effective. Same thing. Same thing. So, therefore, anatomy becomes important. So, again, this was duodenum. Duodenum will be under, which is behind. Remember, because I can't do it so good in this case. Imagine the blue is not here, so blue is in front of this. Okay, I should have done it differently. but <clears throat> Okay. Here should be this pancreas. No, pancreas, liver, sorry. 
what is going on? Liver. So between liver and duodenum and stomach, there is a membrane. There is a there is a membrane. Okay, this is known as ligament. Very good. This ligament is known as hepatogastric, but it has two parts to it. Look, one part is attached to stomach. So this ligament has two parts: gastro, hepatic, and and hepatoduodenal ligament. Okay. Now, <clears throat> right here, there's an opening. Let me just do it different. Let me just do it different. Do you think liver would have impression of esophagus on its backside? Yeah. yeah. You see where it's related? There is a duodenal impression of the liver, on the left liver. Okay, so we talked about this ligament. This ligament is right here. And here this ligament is making a barrier, so there's an opening. This opening is known as foramen, foramen of Winslow. Winslow. Okay, from and Winslow. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah, <clears throat> so it's technically just an opening. That's all. And sometimes fluid can be accumulating there. And then there's an area known as free margin. The free margin is the area which is important. Again, what book are you going to look this up, guys? Moore's Anatomy. Moore's Anatomy. In the abdominal section, you'll find this information. Okay, so there, there is bile duct, and there should be going hepatic artery. Let me do the liver a little bit dark so we can see. And there should be hepatic artery. Remember hepatic artery, we just talked about it, right? And then in this, there should be a purple structure known as coral vein. vein. Let me do it on this side just so we can see it. <clears throat> no. Yeah. They go within the ligament. Gastroduodenal, I mean, sorry, uh, hepatoduodenal artery. Mm -hmm. I mean, hepatoduodenal ligament, sorry. <laughs> they go within, they are within the ligament, hepatoduodenal ligament. This area is known as free margin. Free margin. Free margin is the area of the gastro, I mean, hepatoduodenal ligament. It's part of the hepatoduodenal ligament that carries these three structures. These three structures are known as portal triad. Portal triad. Portal triad. So we're going to try to do, the, what we're going to try to do is on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, practically go over this anatomy. Okay. You, we can. Uh, what happened with the model? We have to get some models to you, so we can use models and pictures and stuff and all those things, so you can see it yourself. Okay. Portal triad. Yeah. <clears throat> Hepatic artery, portal vein, and bile duct. The portal triad is always the same everywhere you go. It's hepatic artery, which is in red, right? bile duct and portal vein. These three make up the portal triad. Portal triad. Okay. What does porta mean? Porta. You know when you go to a port, what is a port? Gateway. Yeah. Opening or a shore or a coast in a sense. So <clears throat> this is a gateway getting to liver, that's what it means. Okay. Portal triad. The portal triad is made of three things, hepatic artery, bile duct, portal vein. And they are located, they're hidden within what? Hepatoduodenal ligament. Behind this, there's a space, you can actually put your finger and clip it if you want to call it cystectin. Back in the days they used to do, not anymore. You can still clip the hepatic artery when you want to remove the gallbladder so it doesn't bleed. Okay, <clears throat> you can clamp it. 
if you wish, so to prevent blood loss during surgery. Okay, so this area is known as free margin. The opening is known as foramen Winslow. <clears throat> In the space behind is called what? The space. Gastro. Epiploic sac. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Gastro epiploic sac. Good job. Which is immediately behind the stomach. Huh? Lizard sac. Lizard sac? Yeah, lizard sac is there too. Yeah. But the greater sac is right behind it. Lesser sac is superior to it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> as far as I know, you know blood supply and nerve supply of stomach. You know histology and anatomy and physiology of stomach. Okay. And you should spend some time on that. They're important. Okay. Now, again, lateral to the stomach you have? Spleen. Posterior to the stomach you have? Kidney and? Pancreas. Okay, superior to the stomach, what do you have? Diaphragm and liver. Inferior to it, what do you have? Transverse colon. Transverse colon and third and fourth part of the water. Okay. As we go more and more to abdomen, you will learn more. So now in BRS, I think it's a lot of reading. Don't do that. Go to Moore's Anatomy or uh, whoever else, Gray's Anatomy in Atlas. Look, study the Atlas of Abdomen. Don't read it. <laughs> Anatomy is not for reading. Look at the picture. See what you see. If you see eyes, say, oh my God, there's eyes, there's lips, there's this. But you're not going to find them in stomach, so just look for stomach and other structures. Okay? Sometimes you do have different names. Different names, different names, different names. Like what, what no, there's two sacs. Lesser sac and greater sac. They're not the same thing. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, there's, there are names. There are some names. So, as I said, first you need to know what it is. And then the names will be there. Usually they'll put the names in. If it's two names, it will put them in bracket. The next name too. Okay? But for anatomy of abdomen, it's very important because it's very busy. There's a lot of structures there. So when you're doing surgery, when you're performing these procedures, you have to be careful not to cut something by mistake. Right? So that's why it's important. You have to know. All right? Let's take a quick break. Yeah. Is the left vagus supply the front of the stomach? Mm hmm. And the right is the back. Mm hmm. Because the rotation of the stomach is what? Left to right or clockwise. Okay. All right. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come to what?